morning is from, uh, from Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 16, Romans 8, 2 through 16. It reads, Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that righteous requirements of the law might fully be met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set upon what that sinful nature desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful man is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation But it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who were led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Let's pray. Father God, as we prepare ourselves for the hearing of your word this morning, I, I pray, Father, that, uh, um, that, that you will uh, just open my heart and my mind to your spirit. Just so work in me, Father, that my words are your words this morning. Uh, we pray, Father, for, for your spirit to just fill this place. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're continuing our series on the creed, and and I know it's been a long series, and and we've just got two more, Uh, but this morning we're going to look at that line, um, I believe in the Holy Spirit, very short line, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, So this morning we're going to look at at a few scriptures that uh, tell us about the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, what its roles are in our lives as we walk with Christ. Um, but before we do, I, I want to just say that the Holy Spirit is perhaps one of the least understood doctrines in the church today. Most Protestants really don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I've had people that I've talked to, even pastors that I've talked to, and, and when I've mentioned the work of the Holy Spirit, they kind of they go silent or they get a blank stare on their face or their eyes get big and, whoa, what's this? And, and sometimes they even joke, oh, you're one of those, huh? Uh, but the Holy Spirit is very scriptural. He, he has a very distinct role in our lives as believers. In fact, the, the Bible tells us that when Jesus went up to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with all of us. The Holy Spirit is the primary way today that God reveals himself to us. Uh, the primary way we, we see his manifestation is through the Holy Spirit today. So, So don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Don't be shy of the Holy Spirit. Most of all, don't be ignorant of the Holy Spirit um, because the Holy Spirit is is, is a very real doctrine of our faith and it's something we need to understand. So um, it seems a a lot of times if if you're a devoted Protestant, it seems that uh, you start talking about the Holy Spirit and other people think you're Pentecostal or something. Um, But... uh, that's not to be feared. It's the work of the Holy Spirit is not to be feared. Um, 
Let me clarify something else right off the bat, too. Uh, sometimes you hear the Holy Spirit referred to as, as the ghost, the Holy Ghost, or something like that. And, and that always kind of bothers me when I hear that. The, the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. It's not like Jesus died and now we have his ghost. That's not the image at all. The, the image in, in both the Greek and the Hebrew uh, root word is, is spirit or wind. It's a spirit. Uh, it's, it's almost like a wind. And, and that idea is that we can't see the spirit. We can't see it, but we can see the effects of it. We see the effects in our lives and in the lives of others who are, who are tuned in and, and live in the spirit. Um, the, the doxology, we used to sing the doxology every week, and that, that refers to uh, the Holy Spirit as, as the Holy Ghost, and that's always bothered me. So he's not a ghost, he's a spirit, a manifestation of God, part of the Trinity. Um, I've identified, as we talk about the Holy Spirit this morning, I've identified four primary roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives, and there are other roles, and I'll mention the fifth as we get towards the end. Uh, but the four primary roles are that, that the Holy Spirit convicts, the Holy Spirit inspires, the Holy Spirit um, indwells, and the Holy Spirit enables. So, so let's talk about each of these individually here. The Holy Spirit convicts. Uh, one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit in the lives of an unbeliever is to convict them of the sin so that they can come to Christ. The Bible says no one comes to Jesus Christ except the Father draw him. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit that does the drawing, and he does that by convicting them of their sin. Sometimes we do something wrong, and we know it's wrong, and we do it, and, and, and we start feeling guilty about it. That's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction to our hearts. That's the Holy Spirit at work, and that's one of the primary ways uh, the Holy Spirit works. Um, we are, tend to be kind of set in our ways, don't we? We kind of do what we want to do. And we're not apt to change unless we sense a strong sense that, that, that we're not doing something right. And that's conviction. We're, we're not overly apt to change unless we're under a great conviction. And so the Holy Spirit brings that conviction in an effort to bring us to himself. And, and if we're already a believer and we're already with Christ, the Holy Spirit continues to convict when we do things wrong so that we come under his conviction and can grow. We can start, we can identify what we're doing wrong and we can grow. Uh, I, I want to give you an example. Uh, if, first, let me give you a Bible verse. John chapter 16, verse 8. I'm going to read it right out of the Bible here. It says, when he comes, he will convict the world, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin, of, of the guilt in regard to sin. Um, so that's uh, a key role. I, I want to give you an example here. Um, back in the 70s, there was a Pro-Am golf tournament. And, and in this tournament, uh, there was a professional golfer, and I don't know the, the main characters in, in the story. This is a true story, but I don't remember the, the name of the main character. But the, he was playing with Jack Nicholas was the other part of the pro. There was a foursome, two professional players and two amateur players. And, and the two amateur players were then-president Gerald Ford and Billy Graham. So this, and the professional was Jack Nicholas and this other guy. So that was a very popular foursome. Everybody wanted to watch them and, and stuff. And, and they played their round and they came back. And one of the, the friends who was also on the tour came up to this professional golfer who played with them and, and said, so what was it like to play with the president and Billy Graham? And the man said, I'm so sick and tired of Billy Graham shoving religion down my throat. And he kind of stopped off, and he was so frustrated, he hit a bucket of golf balls just to try to release his anxiety. Well, well the guy followed him, he was very curious, and he followed him over to the range, and he watched him hit off these golf balls, and afterwards he goes up to him again, and he, and he says, so Billy was pretty hard on you, huh? And he says, no. He never even mentioned religion, and he walked away. And that's a neat story, because Billy Graham uh, was kind of so filled with the spirit that you couldn't spend time with Billy Graham and, and not experience that spirit, and, and not know that you were in the spirit of in the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict of our sins. And just in, in being in the presence of Billy Graham, he was convicted of his sin. And, and he was a little angry about it. He, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't overjoyed, you might say. Um, it was neat. He, Billy didn't even mention, never mentioned God, Jesus, never mentioned sin, never mentioned anything about religion. Yet the man, just in spending time with him, uh, felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Which brings up a question for us. Do others sense the Holy Spirit when we enter a room? Uh, are we that filled with the Holy Spirit that others can sense that? Are people grieved in their hearts, convicted over the sin in their lives when they spend time with us? It's an interesting question. Think about that and, and pray that you might be that filled with the Holy Spirit. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin to bring you to a point where you might be drawn close enough to God that you might want to spend, that you might want to submit to him. Um, once we receive the Spirit, once we surrender ourselves to Christ and we receive the Spirit, we begin to feel the, the second role of the Holy Spirit, and that's that the Holy Spirit indwells the Holy Spirit fills his believer. Every believer has the Holy Spirit living in them. Every believer. As soon as we come to Christ, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. His presence is in the believer is kind of the assurance that, that we have that relationship with Christ. It's kind of that seal of approval. Uh, we see that in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22 says, he anointed us, he set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Every believer, as soon as you come to faith in Christ, you receive that, because that's kind of your stamp of ownership. That's proof that you belong to the Holy Spirit, is that spirit. So every believer is filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, that being said, it is possible to be a Christian and not feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's something to understand. Sometimes we feel, sometimes we don't feel. Our feelings are kind of fickle. Sometimes we, sometimes we feel like a candle, candy bar, sometimes we don't feel like a candy bar. Uh, our feelings are fickle. They're on again, off again. That doesn't mean the promises of God cease to exist just because we can't feel them, okay? You are filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, from the time you, you come to faith in Christ, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, let me give you a couple of examples of times you might not feel it. Sometimes we kind of wander away from things. We, we let our devotion slip. We don't read the Bible that often. We don't pray. We skip prayer. We, we might miss a few weeks of church. I think those are kind of the four stools of a chair that, that make up our faith, the four legs of a chair it's got Bible reading and devotion, that quiet time with God and prayer and, and church attendance and, and participation. And sometimes if, if we let some of those slip a little bit, then, then the voices of the world around us get louder. And we can't always hear that still small voice. So uh, an, an old joke, I, I remember this, I don't know if it's a joke or just a story, but, uh, but a man was, was sitting in a room and this young guy walks in and says, um, I just don't feel that God is, is hearing me anymore. And he's really frustrated and he's angry. And the old man whispers something. And, and so the guy gets a little bit closer and he says it again. I don't feel God is, is hearing me. I don't feel close to God anymore. And, and the old man whispers something else and he gets a little closer and, and eventually he has to get pretty much head to head so he can hear what the man is whispering. And the man says, if you want to hear, you need to get closer. And sometimes with Christ, sometimes we, we let our devotion slip a little bit. We let things slide a little bit. And, and if we want to hear him again, we need to get closer. Now, that being said, there's something else that, that can come into play. It's, it's uh, not as common as that, but it is very real. It's, it's something called the dark night of the soul. We can go through seasons where we don't sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, that term was actually, I was talking to someone this past week, and I thought it was 
going all the way back to the third or fourth century, but it's, it's not. It's much more recent than that. It was like the 16th century that that, uh, that, that name actually came out. But um, some of the most powerful uh, saints in history have experienced this. Um, in the 16th century, uh, a man by the name of, of St. John of the Cross wrote about this season of darkness that, that he experienced. This, um, he, he wrote a poem that, that called it, uh, his soul was experiencing a dark night. He just didn't sense God's presence at all. And uh, there was a, a nun named St. Therese. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of St. Therese. She was a Carmelite nun. Dance time. <laughs> she was a Carmelite nun. She was sometimes called Therese of the Child Jesus or the Little Flower. Um, she's got an amazing life. If you're not familiar with her, you might want to look her up. Um, an incredibly influential and, and spiritual, faithful person. Um, sickly all of her life and only lived 24 years. Became a nun at age 15, passed away at age 24. Yet there were priests from all over the area who used to come and visit with her. And, and not just to give her spiritual prayers and things like that, but they wanted to ask her opinion. They, they wanted to know what she thought of things. Even Pope Pius used to have make appointments with her to run things by her to see what she thought of things. Um, after she died, uh, and then Pope Pius, uh, he, who died in 1914, called her the greatest saint of our modern times. The greatest saint of our modern times. And if you think about that, she was only a nun for like eight or nine years. Yet she was so influential, so filled with faith that... that that, that not only priests, but even the Pope would come and, and talk to her um, to get counsel from her. But even she spent the last 18 months of her life in that dark soul of the night. She just didn't sense God's presence anymore. Even Mother Teresa, we're all familiar with Mother Teresa, perhaps the greatest saint of our, mother, of our, of our modern times, um, experienced a, a dark night of the soul that lasted almost two years. It lasted a little over two years, I think. Um, uh, it's not a new phenomenon from the 16th century. It's addressed in the Bible in the book of Hezekiah, and we saw this in our, in our book study, and I thought this was, I, I hadn't seen this before, but uh, in, in 2 Chronicles 32, verse, verse 31, Hezekiah was a, was a good king. He was one of those kings that followed God. And, and God did tremendous work in Israel before then. He, he destroyed the enemies of Israel during Hezekiah's uh, kingship. Um, but at the end, God kind of withheld his counsel from Hezekiah. It, it, it reads, uh, Hez, uh, 2 Chronicles 32, 31, when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. So at a time when people were wanting to hear from Hezekiah, wanting an answer from Hezekiah, God left him, kind of to see what he had in mind, what he, what he was going to say. Sometimes God leaves us for a season. And I don't believe the Holy Spirit actually leaves us. I, I think he just is silent for a season. Uh, the, the Bible says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always be with you from the time you become a believer on. Um, but sometimes he's quiet for a season. And I, I think that maybe at least one of the reasons he does that is to test and see what's in our heart. Um, so, um, so that is something that's real. Uh, know that the Holy Spirit is still with you. Know that... Um, that maybe like Hezekiah, you can't sense him for a season, uh, but he is still with you. A third role of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit inspires. The Holy Spirit inspires. Um, we know that he inspired people to write the Bible, right? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every word in the Bible was, was God-breathed. 
uh, the Holy Spirit told Paul what to write when he wrote our reading this morning. Told Paul every word to use. Now, we believe that the original languages were inspired, not necessarily New International Version, um, not necessarily King James Version, or whatever your favorite translation is. But we know that as it was written in the Greek and Hebrew, God inspired every word so that we, um, so that, so that we can use it for teaching and training. Um, the Spirit inspired all of the, the Bible writers. Um, the Spirit inspired philosophers and doctors and scientists throughout history. I, I think society is where it is today because the Holy Spirit inspired people to see things in new ways. It's unbelievable if you look at, at some of the greatest inventions um, that, that they, were, they were discovered by a Christian. Um, it's, it's almost, I, I think I read a statistic somewhere, 90-some percent of the greatest discoveries in, in medicine were made by Christians. And I believe that's the Holy Spirit inspiring, allowing people to see things in new ways, and uh, inspiring them to, um, to, to just pushing and prodding us to new things, to seeing things differently so that, so that tremendous gains are made. It's the Holy Spirit that encourages us when we're down. It's the Holy Spirit that motivates us when things get hard, uh, stimulates us to do the right thing, even in crowds of, of not-so-good people. Um, so the Holy Spirit inspires. Uh, the fourth role I'm going to talk about this morning is that the Holy Spirit enables. The Holy Spirit enables us to do these things. Because he indwells and inspires every believer, uh, he enables us to live the life we're called to. He enables us to discern truth from error. He enables us to understand scripture. Uh, he enables us to serve with the gifts and the talents and the abilities that he gave us all. Um, he enlightens and empowers us to live a life that's set apart from the rest of the world. We're different because we've got the Holy Spirit in us. The word enable sometimes seems to be a difficult word these days. We think of that in, in sometimes a negative term. If we give somebody a lot of help, uh, we, we get afraid that we're enabling them, and that means that we're enabling them to avoid taking responsibility for their own lives. Um, but that's not the way the Holy Spirit works. When the Holy Spirit enables us to do something, it's the Holy Spirit enabling us to do something positive. Um, we're enabled to, to do the right thing. We're enabled to do good. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. One of the reasons we receive the Spirit is so that we can do good, that we can do good for ourselves and for the common good, for others. Um, so the Holy Spirit doesn't just... Um, the Holy Spirit enables us to do positive things, to do good things um, for ourselves and for others. So we talked about the four primary roles of the Holy Spirit, uh, convicting, dwelling, indwelling, inspiring, and enabling that being said, living by the Spirit means that, that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to work, to convict us, to inspire us, to indwell in us, and to enable us to do good. That will lead to us living a holy life. Now, our reading also talked about, um, the reading kind of gave us a glimpse of two different lives. There's, there's two different ways we can live, aren't there? We can live by the flesh, or we can live by the Spirit. And those are the only two ways we can live. One or the other, we live in the flesh or we live in the Spirit. The reading talked a lot about that. The flesh is our natural state. It's kind of our default setting. We can live in the flesh or we can live in the Spirit. The Spirit is when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're filled with the Spirit, and we receive that convicting, that, um, 
indwelling um, inspiration and enablement to live as people of faith. If you're in the flesh, in the sinful nature, then Jesus isn't your savior. The mindset of the sinful nature is I, me, myself. It's that whatever feels good mindset. It's very self-centered. It's being more concerned about ourselves than other people. It's being more concerned about what can satisfy me than what can satisfy others. Some people, many people, try to come to God with that mindset. But they never receive his Holy Spirit. They, they don't have the power and the strength to do the work of God because they've never submitted themselves. They've never surrendered themselves to the authority of Christ. They may say Jesus is the Savior or the Messiah, but they've never made him their Messiah or their Savior. So they do good things, but they're doing it in their own power because they've never received the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible's pretty clear that no matter how hard you try to please God, while you're living in the flesh, you can't. When your minds are controlled by the flesh, you cannot please God. It's impossible. The only other way we can live is in the Spirit, to surrender ourselves to Christ and to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You're a believer and you're empowered to live a godly life. Those are the only two choices we have. We can continue to live in sin or we can surrender ourselves and follow him. And every one of us has to make that choice. And if you notice, the reading told us what choice we should make. If you caught that in verses 12 to 14, he said, um, okay, maybe I'm not on the right page here yet. Verses 12 to 14, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. Did you catch that part? We have an obligation. But it's not to the sinful life in order to live by that. For if you live according to the sinful life, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We have an obligation to our Creator to live by the Spirit, not the flesh. Without the Spirit's help, you can't live uh, a fleshy, uh, physical life that pleases God. It's impossible. So let me ask you a question here. How do we know that we're living by the Spirit? What test is there to know that if we're living by the Spirit? Um, I, I guess there's two things. First, from what we said earlier today, we know because we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us, and we sense that. But sometimes we don't sense that. How do we know if we're in the Spirit? Well, the Bible tells us we'll know by our fruits. We'll know by the, if we want to judge somebody else, where, where do they stand with the Lord? You'll know by their fruits. We look at the fruits. And the fruits, the fruits of the Spirit, are love, joy, patience, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does a person live a life reflecting love, joy, peace, patience, those fruits? Do you live a life that reflects love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness? Um, if so, you have the Spirit in you. And, and there's two ways this works. I, I think partly as Christians, we begin to try to live that way. We, we try to live lives that are more loving, joyful, peaceful, gentle, self-controlled. But also as the Holy Spirit is in us, we become transformed. That's another role of the Holy Spirit that I alluded to. This is like Holy Spirit 101. That would be a second level course. That would be in Holy Spirit 201. <laughs> okay, I just made that up transforming into the image of Christ is one of the other roles of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in us to transform us into the image of Christ. Christ reflected those fruits. As we become more and more Christ-like, our lives uh, relate, uh, reflect 
those fruits, we become more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, um, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled. That's part of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. If you want to know if, if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, does your life reflect those? You want to know if your neighbor has the Holy Spirit living in them, does their life reflect those things? Uh, that's how the Bible tells us we can know. Um, if you feel convicted this morning, know that that could be the Holy Spirit drawing you to himself. And, and if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior yet, you're welcome to come up during the singing of this uh, closing song. Uh, if you have and you feel the convicting of the Holy Spirit, well, you can come up also then for, for some more prayer. That, that, that's the Holy Spirit convicting that there's something going on in your life that's not right. Uh, and again, if you want special prayer, come on forward at the, at the end of the special song. Um, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit living in us, not just as a seal of, of, our, of our ownership, that, that we belong to you, but, but just because of uh, the inspiration, because of the transformation, transformation that takes place in our hearts and our lives, because of that, uh, we thank you, Father, as we've surrendered to you, that you don't just leave us where we were, uh, but that you fill us with the Holy Spirit to make us who we can be. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.